I do want to take just a moment, welcome everybody that's with us online, and also welcome everybody at the Kootenai County Jail that's with us. We love that you're part of this. And we're in a series called, If God's Got It, I Want It. The premise I'm preaching from uh, is that when it comes to what's offered to me in Christ, I don't want to have any amount, any degree, any type of caution. Um, how many know that when somebody's trying to upsell you, you, you want a little bit of select, when it comes to like the menu, have you noticed that anybody go through Starbucks about one to three times a day and, <laughs> and, and we just noticed it's like they must have got orders from headquarters because they're always trying to upsell you. You know, there's, hey, do you want an extra shot? I'm like, I don't, extra, when, where'd that come from? You know, you want a breakfast, you want this. You, I could also sell you a home. I said, what's going on? I just want a coffee. <laughs> And uh, so it's all right to be selective with a menu, with, with somebody trying to sell you, you know. But what I'm trying to say, what I, what I want us to have in our spirit, what I want in my spirit, what I want in yours, is that when it comes to Jesus, the Savior, because our God is so good, that when it comes to the Savior, we just aren't selective. That it's not like a menu that we're picking and choosing from, and I'll have that, but not that. But we're simply saying, God, if you've got it, I trust you, and even if I don't fully understand it, God, even if it seems impossible at this moment, God, if you've got it, then I want it. So it's a faith declaration that's saying, God, I want the fullness of your promises, your blessing, your favor, God, your provision, and also your claim on my life, your call on my life. I don't want to give you some of my life or certain categories or parts of my life, God, but I'm all in. I, I want to give you all my life. Amen. We read this last week. Um, I want to go back to it one more time as a sort of anchor for the spirit of this uh, series. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20 says, For no matter how many promises God has made. And I just love that because it just, it just feels like they're just stacking up. Just like when you thought, God, I'm, I'm so full of promises, God says, but yet I've got another good promise. No matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. So every promise, no matter how impossible it might look from your, your current you know, um, vantage point, it's yes in Christ. And the picture the apostle is painting here is that God preaches these, these sure and, and, and steadfast and great, prom they're powerful promises. And, and because they're so powerful, our response, our amen, should be equally passionate. That it's like if God gave us a so-so, kind of boring, kind of lame promise, we might be like, well, okay, sure, whatever. But if God's really given us a great promise, then we should respond with an amen full of great passion. I've been in church, I'm telling you, my entire life, and I have seen this over and over and over again. It's really not about how good the sermon is. It's not about how good the preacher's preaching. It's, it's really not about the sermon. It's about the condition of the soil, the one that's receiving and you can see this every single week. There'll be somebody on your road that, that's got one eye open and, and, and is thinking about, can I have Taco Bell for lunch one more time and not die? <laughs> and then a few chairs down, there'll be somebody that is encountering God and hearing from heaven. And what God is working in their heart is going to change the trajectory of their entire life and take them out of destruction into God's destiny, all sitting up under the same sermon. Why? The sermon wasn't different. The amen in their heart was different. And so we're wanting to say, God, I want a strong, I want a passionate, I want to be full of zeal. When I say amen, I'm going to be the kind of charismatic, crazy stand up. Amen. Come on, somebody. Anybody got an amen? Come on, because charismatic's got the best amens. You know that. Some of us are still stuck in the Baptist head nod. You know what I mean? We need to get a little charismatic something in us say Amen. All right, today, um, let's go to Joshua chapter 6, and as you're turning to chapter 6 of Joshua, that Old Testament book, uh, I want to read one of the most famous stories in the whole Bible, even if you're new to church, never really been to church, um, I bet you know at least the basics of this story, and um, let's read it together. Joshua 6 and verse 1 says, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. 
March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear the sound, uh, when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Let's conclude our reading there. And today I'm preaching from the subject. Check this out, the silent shout. The silent shout. Let's ask um, a basic question of the text. Why were the gates of Jericho securely barred up? Well, the Bible tells us it was because of the Israelites. We were in some of these verses last week, but the people of Jericho had actually watched as the God of miracles had showed up and worked, moving mightily, powerfully, wonderfully on their behalf. God had stopped up the waters of the Jordan. From where the people of Jericho were located, they would have been able to see, even as the Israelites, about three million strong, had come to the opposite side of this Jordan River and camped. And for a moment, they would have been saying to themselves, saying amongst themselves, oh, well, we've got some time because this river is at flood stage. Um, they're never gonna be able to get to us. They won't be able to make it across. So it, we at least have a number of months to prepare, you know, to get the swords sharpened, to, to make sure that, that all our fighters are trained. Um, they're coming for us, but, but they won't be able to cross yet. And, and then as they're watching them camp, they, they see the priests of the Israelites, the Hebrews, all of a sudden with their priestly garments and they're holding the Ark of the Covenant, this heavy box overlaid with gold. And, and they're, they're looking at each other like, now why are those priests waiting out in the water with that heavy box? Now what in the world are they doing? These crazy Israelites, what are they up to now? Don't they know they're never gonna make it across the water? But then all of a sudden, the river stopped running. And now the, now the people of Jericho are freaking out because they're realizing that what they, they thought they had time to prepare for was suddenly a very imminent problem. Come on, somebody. Now, can I tell you something? Why am I saying all of this? The reason that, that the, the people of Jericho were fearing the Israelites is, is I, I believe, a prophetic declaration over somebody's life. You have spent long enough fearing your enemy, and it's time for your enemy to fear you. How does it happen? It happens when you've established a history in God of miracles, of breaking through, of, of refusing to turn around and give up just because an impossibility got in your way. When you have a history of faith, when, when your enemy has watched you cross over, now the enemy will be the one full of fear. I wanna be the kind of believer that, that's not so worried about the enemy, but I wanna be the kind of believer that my enemy, come on, is worried about me. Now, Joshua and the Israelites, they are in a time of transition, a time of transition. They're gonna go from knowing of the promises of God to now standing in the promises of God. And I believe that this is the word of the Lord for more than a few people here on this Sunday at the Cause Church, that, that you've had a long extended season where you've had the knowledge and you've had that revelation and you have known of the promises of God, but now you're in a time of transition and you will find yourself and your family and your people standing in the promises of God. Anybody got an amen for the promises of God? Now, God's promise to them was specifically to give them the land of Canaan, that land that was flowing with milk and with honey. And milk and honey, that was the best they had. Come on, they didn't, honey was it. Like they didn't have Krispy Kremes back then. Or, or maybe God would have said something like that land flowing with like Rogers cheeseburgers and Krispy Kremes, but come on, it was flowing with milk and with honey. And it was promised to them, of course, generations earlier to the patriarch of the faith, uh, Abraham. And God had said to Abraham, if, if you'll get up and you'll leave this place that you've known and you'll go where I'm calling you to go, I will bless you in such a way that you will become a blessing. God was speaking to Abraham about the fact that the Israelite people would produce the one that of Abraham's lineage would come the one that would be the savior of the world. 
And so there are cosmic level history of all people on the earth at all times, level promises attached to them moving now in to Canaan. I want you to see that they were in a time of transition because maybe you right now are in a time of transition. You know, maybe from the way that you were living to now the way that you're going to live. You know, you can be born again by the spirit of God and, and, and you can be redeemed and, and you can be forgiven. And, and there can be a moment where you're in a time of transition in the sense that you've stepped out of what's old, but you don't yet know really how to live in what's new. So you're in a time of transition or, or maybe God's leading you into something new in the realm of relationships. You've had to cut some relationships off and some new relationships need to be brought on or, or maybe God has given you more. And, and, and what I feel today as I preach to you is that many of us, we're in a time of transition where what has been promised, we're finally going to possess. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's restoration in your marriage or maybe it's ministry, a dream, a vision that God's put in your heart. But what we've got to recognize is transition even when it's good and even when it's God and even if it's the right time, transition is always tough. It's always tough for a whole lot of reasons. Transition is always tough. For Joshua specifically, Joshua had been a good assistant to Moses. But of course, there's always a big difference between being the assistant and then being the one in charge. Come on, somebody. I, I had to figure that out in real time when God called us to plant a church. I, I had been an assistant to the pastor, come on. I had been a worship pastor. And how many know that there's a difference? Joshua was about to go from being assistant to the regional manager. <laughs> office fans, any, okay. <laughs> For some reason, Christians love the office, so we decided that. I think part of the reason transition can be tough is because Watch this, it will, it will often require you to face the feeling of leaving behind the confidence you developed in one stage and embracing the insecurity that's going to accompany the next stage. You could keep taking the same class over and over and over, and every time you do, you're gonna have more confidence that when it comes to the exam, you're gonna get an A. Come on, somebody. But of course, the issue would be that your need for feeling confident would rob you of getting what was waiting for you in the next course. I don't wanna fool myself into feeling good for getting A's in third grade when God is calling me, come on, to get some B's or maybe even some C's, but to get some college credit. Because what I've seen is that certain people would rather feel secure in a lesser place when God has called them to face their fears and to step into a greater promise. So God tells Joshua, fear not, for I am with you. Which by the way, is always the reason to fear not. It's never because it's gonna go like you wanted it to go. It's never because, oh, it's fine. Don't, it, no, it's, it's always, I'm with you. I'm with you. It, it, it's, oh, it's always born out of a, the place of God's presence. Presence people are always promised people. In fact, it's, it's to be in God's presence when, when, we're a, when we're a worshiping person, when we draw near to the Lord, when, when we're finding ourselves in God's presence, that's where we get an appetite that's born for greater promises. You know, it's only in God's presence that you can be completely satisfied and also hungry for what's next all at the same time. And so God comes and says, Joshua, fear not. I'm with you, and God's with you. But why did God tell Joshua to fear not? Because oftentimes, faith and fear, they're not the same, but they can feel very similar. They can feel very similar. What it often comes down to is that I can let my fear swallow up my faith, or very genuinely, I can let my faith swallow up my fear. Fear's hungry, but so is faith. Woo. What I don't want to do in my life, my walk with the Lord, my, my calling in Christ. I, I don't know if this has happened in your life, but what's so precious to me is the fact that God has called me. That God put an assignment on my life. That God looked and, and, and saw me in all, all just whatever I was doing and said, you know what? I want, I want to use you. That becomes very precious to you as you walk with the Lord. But I, what I don't want to do 
is avoid the feeling of fear, but then act like I'm functioning by faith. So we can live beneath the call of God and do our very best to avoid anything that might make us afraid. And then we can try and, try and qualify that by saying, well, since I don't feel afraid, I must be walking by faith. Why did the Lord tell Joshua, be strong and courageous, fear not? Because there was a whole lot of reasons to be afraid. Fear not. Why? Because there's a whole lot of stuff going on in Canaan that could potentially make you very afraid. Be because the promise wasn't to continue feeling safe in the desert and eating quail. It was to possess the land of Canaan. So at some point, we can't just keep waking up and saying, well, I just trust God for the quail and I, I, I know that there's gonna be quail and I'm, I'm just confident in the quail. At some point, we've got to realize I am done with quail. It's time to take Canaan. Now, I might not have the same level that I had of confidence when I was eating quail, but I'm gonna go ahead and take Canaan. It might feel like fear, but actually what I'm doing is I'm taking a step finally now by faith. And it was a time of transition, especially for Joshua. The Israelites, but I would say especially for Joshua because Joshua was now having to figure out how to lead while everybody was looking. And, and maybe you're in a similar situation where you're having to kind of just go ahead and do it even though you feel unprepared. It's like, it's time. Like that happens every time you have a kid. Come on, parents. You might have read a parenting, you might have read all the parenting books. But it turns out nothing can prepare you for having an actual child depending on you for their survival. Transitions can be tough because it's almost like you have to practice and perform all at the same time. I still got one leg in, in what was, but I've got the other leg in what is and what will be. And so transitions are tough and taking on something new and maybe God is opening a door for you and you have more responsibility and you're influencing people and you kind of feel like asking the Lord, Lord, I know you picked me for this, but are you sure? Because I think they would do pretty good with the job. You're, you're secretly insecure that other people are like, um, really, it's you? Like, you know, they know, God knows, you're worried. <laughs> what I'm trying to preach is, is that you can't let the difficulty of a transitional moment have you running back to the desert. It is time to enter the next stage of the promise. So in Joshua 5, I didn't read this, but in the previous chapter as a setup for crossing over and, and, and taking Jericho, in Joshua 5, the angel of the Lord appears to Joshua. And most Bible scholars, theologians would readily agree that this angel of the Lord was actually what we would call a Christophany, meaning an appearance of Christ in the Old Covenant. Uh, similar to when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember them, into the fire they had to go. But as they got thrown in, uh, the fire only served to burn off the bands around their wrists and ankles, but did not burn them. And the Bible records that there was a fourth one in the fire. Some translations even say with the likeness as of the appearance of the Son of God. What was that? It was a Christophany. So here again, we see that this angel of the Lord, most people say, this is Jesus coming and meeting with Joshua. And so what Jesus says to Joshua is very specific. And, and, and this angel of the Lord says, Joshua Take off your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy. Now, why'd the angel of the Lord tell Joshua to do that? Part of it was no doubt to evoke a spirit of worship, to remind Joshua, hey, you need to put down, sometimes, sometimes the war is won by putting down the sword and lifting up your voice and just to go ahead and sing. To, to, that, that, that the war always belongs to the worshiper. It was a reminder to Joshua, this one will not be by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's gonna be by my, you're gonna participate, but this one's gonna be by my power. And so it was certainly for uh, an invitation to surrender, but, but I see something else there, and, and I believe the answer's in Deuteronomy 29, uh, verse five. We've, we've got it up on the screen here. Why'd the angel say, take off your sandals? Here's what those verses say. Yet the Lord says, during the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. Do you know that verse was in the Bible? 
It's incredible. I, I'm, I'm praying, God, do that for me. Do that for my kids, God. In, in fact, God, if you could just stop, you know, maybe like, maybe do this. Maybe have their shoes grow with their feet. <laughs> However you want to do it, Lord, it's up to you, but I'm just saying I'm open to receiving. <laughs> but, but God said, your clothes didn't wear out and, and neither did the sandals on your feet. What was happening? It was the Lord saying, Joshua, you are done wandering in the desert. You're not going back. You're not gonna need what you used to need. Take off your shoes. You're moving out of your need to survive and for me to carry you and sustain you in a lesser place. Take off your shoes. I'm moving you into a greater place. It was good to have those shoes for a while. It was good to have those while you needed them. But until you're willing to step out of what's kept you safe, you'll never actually be able to take the next step. Those shoes represented the past. And if you're going to get in the promise, you're going to have to let go of the past. All the dust and the dirt and the desert that was stuck on those shoes after 40 long years, it all had to be taken off if they were going to enter in. It was time for new shoes because the angel never said, put your shoes back on. And so I have to assume by implication of the text that this was a permanent removal of the shoes that had sustained in the desert. It was time for a new kind of shoe. If, I, if I'm going to go play golf, I put on a certain kind of shoes. Come on, because you want the shoe to fit the occasion. If let's say I was, um, I was an insane person and I was going to run for fun. Because I've heard about people doing this and I pray for them that God would restore their. If I was going to do that, I'd put on running shoes. If I go ride a dirt bike, I put on come on some riding boots because the shoe is supposed to fit the occasion. And it was like God saying, those shoes were good for those long years that you were lost. But now it's time to take new land and you're going to need a new kind of shoe. Oh, that's why God said, I'm going to give you every place that the sole of your foot treads upon. So, so what's the point? We have to be willing to let go of what helped us in one season, but that will hinder us in the next season. It, it, it's time to take off what worked before because God is doing something new right now. So, so don't, don't let the extended season of, of God needing to keep you safe stop you now from taking the next step. God says, I kept you in the desert. I feel God on this. I kept you in the desert. I kept you through your hurt. I kept you through your pain. I kept you through that turmoil. I kept you through them abandoning you. I kept you through the divorce. I kept you in the desert. But now it's time to take that off because I'm taking you into destiny. Ooh. Okay, so... Let's look at their entrance now into this promise, this time of transition, and I'm gonna give you three points. And from what I've heard, people that take notes, they love it when I preach in points. I don't always do that, but if you're a note taker, welcome. I'm gonna, you're welcome, I'm gonna do it today, okay? <laughs> so here's something significant to see. Um, we've got to see the writing on the wall. The writing on the wall, um, meaning there are clear signs that something that's in your way is going to fall and crumble and no longer be in your way. Um, yes, they were facing a wall, but at the same time, the Israelites, they saw the writing on the wall. God was at work. God had, had split the sea. Now God had stopped the river and God was at work. And yes, they were facing a wall, but at the same time, they could see the writing on the wall. The people of Jericho would not be able to stand up against their God. And Joshua 6.2 really shows the nature of what happens when God gives a promise it says, the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighters. God says, I have. Pay attention to the tense. God doesn't say, I will. God doesn't say, hey, I've been considering. Hey, if, if, if you mind your P's and Q's, I might. But God says, I have. So God was speaking in past tense about a yet to be realized promise because with God it's as good as done now if my 13 year old says I haven't cleaned my room yet but I'm about to it's as good as done I don't believe that <laughs> but with my God with your God when God says it's as good as done and speaks in that past tense kind of spirit 
Our job by faith is to believe it's as good as done. We, we have a role. We, we have a role to, to see it like God already sees it, which is as good as done. So, so part of faith is behaving like you have it before you actually have it. R remember the, the widow woman that encountered the prophet Elisha. At no point was God like, hey, I'm going to give you all this oil and then when you have this oil, you better go out and collect empty vessels so that you have somewhere to put the oil. God said, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to behave like you have it before you have it. I want you to go collect empty vessels. And once you've got the containers, then I'll give you the oil. We've been in a standoff. We've been saying, God, where's the oil? Because if I get some oil, then I'll go get a vessel. But God says, if you'd go get a vessel, I'd give you the oil. Faith means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a way to live like what's not done is already done. I'm preaching about real, biblical, actual faith. And it's not fluffy. And it's not about your feelings. It's different. This is faith. It flows from God's heart who speaks and the world is framed. God says, I want you to behave like it's done until it's done. So, so God says, I have given it into your hands. So for them, for us... Faith comes down to this. I have to find a way to participate in the promise. It's going to be by God's power, but I got to find a way to participate. Now, for them, what did they do? They got all their fighters ready to go into a city that was currently surrounded by a wall that they could not get through. That, that means I'm going to do something that makes no sense unless God pours out his spirit. Prepare the fighters. Get everybody ready. It, it, it's like that real, raw, actual faith. It always means I'm going to live like I have it before I actually have it. And watch what happens. Even though God said it was already done, there was still something they had to do. E even though it was by God's power, they still had to participate. God said, it's already done. I'm taking down the wall. But that does not mean that you don't still have to take a walk. March around this city for six days. On the seventh day, seven times. Then hit the horns and shout. And the, God says, it's already done, but, but there's still something yet for you to do. Be, because I'm not receiving passively, I'm participating in the promise. That's, that's the real spirit of what I believe God has for us. You know, even in this series, these, these messages, this season, God's looking for something. Are you willing to participate in the promise? It, it, it means I'm not marching for a victory. I'm marching from a victory. But I still have to march. I still got to go around the walls. It's already been established in heaven, but now I declare and, and I trust God and it's by my believing and, and by my believing behavior that it's released. What's already in heaven is released on the earth. Yes. You understand that God, God has done something greater than just simply doing it for us. That would have been good, but God had something even better. God said, I want to do it through you. It's a restoration to our bearing of God's image and God is a God of authority. And God lends us authority and restores us to that image that we'd participate in what God is doing. So, so you still got to take a walk. You still, you still got to walk. It's, God's going to work, but you still got to take a walk. I'll bring it into my world, and, and maybe you can find a way to apply it to yours. As a ministry, we... It's been incredible. We've already seen many, many, many hundreds of people born again and saved and, and come into life in God. And as wonderful as that is, we feel like it's not just like a wish or a dream or and I hope so, but we feel that we have an actual promise from God that many hundreds would turn into many tens of thousands. Now, with that promise, here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to say, all right, Lord, I'll be at home watching the master's. And I might cook up something on the Traeger and I'm, I'm God, I'm going to be chilling. And then you let me know when all those thousands are there and I'll show up and preach. I, I, I don't preach when the thousands get here. I preach until the thousands get here. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You, you got to apply that to your life. But, but we have to find a way to participate in the promise. It, it, it's, it's not just, oh God, I hope so, but God... By what I'm doing, I believe that, God, this is what you're doing. The writing's on the wall. It can't stand. It won't stand. It's, God has said it. You're going to see it. Now, um, if we're going to break through into this promise, 
that God would have for us over our lives. Um, here's my next point. We have to know at some, at, at some level, we're gonna hit the wall. We're gonna hit the wall. Um, if, you're, if you're gonna get into it, you just gotta go ahead and say, God, um, I just realized I'm gonna hit the wall. Um, the reason it's so key that we catch this is because it's all too easy to assume that if it's God, if God was in this, well, it wouldn't be so difficult. You know, we say that. We say, well, you know, when, when it's God, there's gonna be grace, that's gonna be easy. Show me that in the Bible. <laughs> in fact, if anything, when God interrupts people's lives, their lives do not get easier, but exponentially more difficult. <laughs> Moses was just out on the backside of the desert hanging out with the sheep and the goats and the cows. And all of a sudden, God shows up and now Moses is stressed out. <laughs> but we say stuff like, like, well, it's gonna be easy, but if it's God, and, and we have to stop thinking that just because we're blessed, there won't be a battle. We, the, the, the presence of problems does not mean that you're not looking at a promise. I, I want you to get this in your spirit. I want you to get this in your heart, in your paradigm. Because next time you're going after something in God and, and you actually hit the wall, you might not be discouraged, but the opposite could actually happen. You, would, might, you might be encouraged. I, I'll show you why. You only hit walls when you're taking new grounds. After all, Jesus said, you're a rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Meaning you're only going to come up against something that it seems as though you can't break through. You're only going to come up against the impossible. You're only going to get a gate if you're taking new grounds. So, so if you're not hitting any gates, it means you're not taking any new ground. you got to remember that the people of Jericho did not come and attack them. They came and attacked the people of Jericho. What I'm saying is that there is actually enemies that you will never have to face and that will never be a problem just so long as you are okay living outside of God's promise. But as soon as you decide, if God's got it, I want it. If God's promised it, I will possess it. Then you have to have an expectation of brand new and very fierce enemies coming your way. The wall does not mean you're going in the wrong direction. The wall means you're going in the right direction. You know where there wasn't any walls? Out in the desert. Nobody cares about all that sand. Nobody's fortifying and protecting all that desert dirt. You, you never hit walls when you're spinning circles. You're never gonna hit the wall if you're okay living in the same old sin. You, you're never gonna hit a wall if you don't expect it to ever be any different than it is. Living in low expectation, if you're assuming it's never gonna happen, it's, it's, only, it's only when you actually believe that God is at work. Here's what happens. You start believing God's word, you're gonna hit some walls. Woo! Run right in, hit your head on that wall. You got some blessed bruises. Because God's at work. Is this all right? You get something? Okay, and finally, with this toughness of transition, sometimes it's going to be like talking to a brick wall. Now, this to me is a very clever preaching point because they are literally about to talk to a brick wall. They're going to shout at the wall. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> Encouraging myself in the Lord. Remember how I read to you about the strong amen in the house? That's, that would be like, a, like when I said talking about you, somebody should have went amen. That's like, oh, it's okay. I'm going to let it go. I ain't mad at you. <laughs> okay. They, they, they're literally about to talk to a brick wall. God said, march for seven days, hit the horns, the, 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 the shofar, and then shout, speak to the wall, talk to the brick wall. But something stood out to me that I had never really fully taken notice of before. You know, it's, it's, it's so crazy how you can read the same passage dozens of times, maybe a hundred times, and all of a sudden, God will highlight, and it seems as, as though it's all you can see. And that's the power of Scripture. It's alive because God is alive, and, 
and, and stay in the scripture and stay in your Bible and, and read back over that verse and all of a sudden God will just deposit something that just gives you victory. And, and I saw something that, that God highlighted to me, Joshua 6 and verse 10. Joshua had commanded the army. This is before they're gonna march around. This is before they're gonna blast the, the shofars and they're gonna shout. Before all that, Joshua commands the army, says, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. Do you see that? When, when it's time to shout, you better shout. But up until then, I want you to keep absolutely silent. As I read that, I thought about all these verses that have become familiar to me you know, at, at this point. And I thought about how James, the half-brother of Jesus, came along and said, you know, your tongue is, is very powerful. It's actually like the rudder of a ship, meaning it's steering the direction your life's going to take. I thought about one of Solomon's Proverbs of great wisdom, where Solomon says, the power of life and death are in the power of the tongue, and those that love it will taste of its fruit. It's like, well, I probably am what I eat, meaning like I'm a taco. Like, like I, am, I am what I eat, like what goes into my mouth matters, but what comes out of my mouth actually shapes my life. I thought about the psalmist, you know, that prayed, Lord, put a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. The, the, the psalmist realized it matters what comes out of my mouth. And, and I just, I realized something really simple. I, I, I would dare to say though, it's very significant for our faith, especially in intense times of transition. What you don't say is just as important as what you do say. Proverbs 29, 11 says, only a fool gives full vent to their spirit. Why was it so important for the Israelites to keep silent for the next six days? Because that's a long time. I don't know about you. I'm known to be a bit of a talker. You know, I see these statistics out there about how this is how many words a woman says a day. This is how many words a man says a day. And, and we flip the script in our marriage. I like to think I'm manly except for that part. Okay. And my wife's looking at me like, yep, it's true. I'll carry on for 17 minutes. She, all she has to do is nod. But, but the command is clear. Keep absolute silence for six long days. What was happening? They were back to something very similar that they'd done for an entire generation. They were once again going to be going around and around and around. And what do you think, if they were allowed to talk, what do you think they would have been talking about? How impossible is this wall to break through? This is never going to happen. I can't believe, Joshua has lost it. Joshua's trying to be cool like Moses, and this is never going to work. This is never, those walls must be 10 feet thick and they would have prophesied out their own belief until it spread throughout all the people. But even more, the people of Jericho, they were watching them and they were listening to them and God wanted their enemy intimidated by them not to have them intimidated by their enemy. And God was saying, all I want for your enemy to hear is the sound of your marching feet. What was God doing? God was setting them up that, that they might have their doubts, but God was saying, I want you to keep silent so your doubts don't have you. So, so here's a principle. Just because it crosses your mind does not mean it needs to come out of your mouth. I'm ministering to some marriages now. I'm helping some people with your manager at work. You're about to get promoted. Just because it crosses your mind doesn't mean it has to come out of your mouth. I'm helping you be more popular at church just because it crosses your mind. <laughs> you ever been around somebody who's, all they can seem to do is just speak out everything is going to go wrong and everything is going to be a disaster and everything negative and everything not right? They're exhausting. In fact, if I don't text you back, you might... I'm teasing, I'm teasing. There's a time to shout. There's a time for a high praise and a declaration of faith that stands on the rock in God's word. And, 
And there's a time to, to say and repeat what God has said, but just as important as the shout, maybe is the silence. Maybe instead of letting doubt consume you, there's coming on your life a supernatural in the spirit, a supernatural silence. That they would say, God, until you form something in me by faith, I refuse to say anything, God, until I'm gonna say it in trust and unadulterated faith in your promises, God. Because what they'd done for a generation is they'd gone circle after circle after circle and they were grumbling and they were complaining and they were talking about why'd you even bring us out of Egypt? At least back there we had something to eat and they were, they were, they were so negative and they were so full of doubt and, and now God was saying, it's time where what out in the desert you got wrong, you're gonna finally get right. This time you're gonna circle in silence. What if you stop speaking about how it's never gonna change? And you just circled in silence until faith hit your spirit to shout. I'm not talking about going mute. I'm talking about in the spirit. Did you let God deposit the faith for a miracle? Sometimes the silence is louder than the shout. Isn't that right, Pastor Bill? It, that sometimes our silence is deafening to the enemy. Yet the enemy would stand back and say, I, I thought I'd have you speak in all kinds of death and negativity and doubt by now. I can't believe you're holding your tongue. I'm silent now, devil, but give me a few more laps. I'm silent now, but when God hits the horn, when the wind blows, when God uses me like an instrument, I might be silent today, but tomorrow I'm gonna shout and the walls will fall down. And you know what happened? At their shout, like talking to a brick wall, the, the very walls that had held them out now became steps that helped them in. It's, it's an obstacle now. It's gonna be an opportunity tomorrow. When the shout hits. But, but, but here's where I wanna end. It's gonna feel like I'm ending on a low light. But I'm preaching about participating in the promise. And I wanna show you something that's gonna help you. What did the walls falling down actually mean? Because we pray, God, make a way. God, give me the breakthrough. And I don't know that we ever pause to actually consider what we are praying to break through into. Do you understand that when God gives you a breakthrough, you're breaking through into a greater battle. You know who wasn't messing with them out in the desert? The people of Jericho. But now that the walls fell down, guess what happened next? They still had to come in with their swords. You, you know, when you've established something in your life by your faith, it just means you're gonna face a greater fight. I know this is kind of a bummer, but, but, but when, when God makes a way, God is entrusting you with the next war. They, they came in, but that didn't mean that their enemy had ran out. Just because you step into the promise, it, it doesn't mean now your life's gonna be full of, empty of problems. It's, this, I don't know if this sounds strange. I don't know if anybody's ever preached this to you before, but even promises are still full of problems. But the same God that helped you in will help you run your enemy out. <laughs> Woo! Let's go ahead and stand up and...